Thank you, Julie. Well done. Tychicus. <laughs> oh, man. They would see names like, you know, Jim and Bill. Weird. <laughs> All right. One of the more emotional experiences I've had uh, was reading that passage from the cell at the Mamertine prison cell in Rome where Paul most likely wrote it, a dark and dank place. And these are the last words he ever wrote. We are coming to the end of 2 Timothy. We have two more messages this week and then two weeks from today. And um, Paul wrote these words uh, in, that, in that Mamertine jail or he... he um, uh, spoke them to Luke, who wrote them down. We, we don't know exactly, but uh, these are the last words he wrote. Now, um, a guy by the name of John Pollock has written uh, a really good biography on Paul called The Apostle. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. He surmises that Paul actually had two trials in here before, uh, before Nero in Rome. The first, to determine whether or not he was a conspirator, in the destructive fire which destroyed most of Rome during the reign of Nero. That's how we get the phrase that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Um, uh, nobody really knows exactly, but uh, the Christians became a great scapegoat for Nero to take attention off of himself, and that's when persecution started in earnest, uh, where he lit up roads by burning Christians and uh, took them, it was really a terrible time to be a believer. Apparently, Paul was acquitted of that. He mentions it here in chapter that at his first hearing, nobody was with him except the Lord, which is a pretty good guy to have as an advocate. And, and Paul used that opportunity to once again preach the gospel to the most powerful people on earth during that time. But a less dishonorable but equally serious charge uh, was still before him and uh, had to be ruled on. And this was the charge of propagating a forbidden cult. Now, the Romans really didn't know what to do with Christians up until this time. They kind of considered them Jewish and they treated them as they would have any Jewish sect. Um, but, but now they are beginning to see this is something a little bit different. But like the Jews, the Christians weren't playing ball with the emperor, who by this time in uh, Roman history, the emperors uh, declared themselves the, that they were a god. And because Christians and Jews only worshipped one god, they obviously couldn't worship and bow down and, and, and you know, make nice to the emperor in that way. And as a result... Um, Nero started to enforce this policy, and Christians were considered uh, atheists because they didn't worship the emperor. And so Paul was likely on trial for propagating this thing called the way, or as they had become called Christians. So now, if you're Paul, and you know you're writing your last words to a young man who is one of the most important people in your life and who you're depending upon to carry on, what do you say? What is on your mind? As you know that uh, Paul didn't know how long, but he knew that the trial that was coming was going to be for show only. Uh, there was a predetermined result of that trial. Only one thing could happen, and that was Paul was going to lose his life through beheading. They couldn't put him on a cross because he was a Roman citizen. So what's, what's he going to say? All right, so here's what the message is about today. Paul, before he goes to his death, gives Timothy a final challenge to proclaim the word of God. He instructs Timothy about the reasons for doing this and the ways that he should do it. Or, I'm sorry, I misread that. Instructs Timothy about the reasons for doing it and the reward for doing it. The purpose is to encourage all of us, all of us, to serve Jesus in the way that he's called us and equipped us. What you're going to hear is that we are all responsible for proclaiming the word. So here we go. First point today is this, the challenge to Timothy, so again, this is Paul, this is the last things, these are the last things on his mind to write to Timothy. Proclaim the word. Proclaim the word. Now we're going to go back to verse 1 
in a little while, but for now I just want to deal here in verse 2 with the charge. He says, I charge you in verse 1, and this is what he says, I want you to proclaim or to preach the word. He could not say this any stronger. It's, do not fail at this. This is a priority. Preach the word. Now, I put the word proclaim there because I think it's a better word than just preach. It, it gives the, the, the nuance of the word better than just preach. Because when we hear the word preach, we think of what I'm doing right now, right? Proclaim can have a lot of different forms, and I believe that's the better translation of that word. It's, it's, it's uh, translated both with both preach and proclaim in, in different English Bibles, so I think proclaim here is a better word. So that brings us to the question, what exactly is Paul telling Timothy to do? To preach the gospel or to teach the Bible or both? What, what is this preaching the word all about? Well, the gospel is first and foremost a story that gives birth to a proclamation. The story is really all about scripture. If you were at Jim Farr's memorial service on Monday night, I just gave brief reference to this. But the gospel is the whole ball of wax. It's a story. Everything depends. If you don't accept the first premise that God created us and the second premise that we fell into sin, then how is the salvation that comes later good news? If, if those two things are not true, the salvation proclamation which comes later is nonsense, right? So the whole thing hangs together. The whole story of Scripture, creation, God creating male and female in his image, the fall, human pride and depravity, God's judgment, but his grace to keep Noah and his family alive, Abraham and the Jewish people and their nation, their captivity in Egypt, their deliverance through Moses, their successes when they were faithful to God, and their incredible failures when they weren't. It is God, the jilted lover that the prophets talk about to the nations, imploring them to come back to him. And then finally, the salvation through the Messiah. All the nations of the earth would be blessed through the seed of Abraham, the Jewish people, eventually Jesus. Offering salvation to all and the gospel message of the Messiah coming to earth as a man. Dying, being buried, resurrecting, and will return one day. All of this means that it's a message, in preaching the word, it's a message that must be communicated with words. It, it, it has to have words attached to it. It is a message. It's, it's not a group event where we try to come to consensus, it's God's message to us. That's why Paul said, I delivered to you what I also received. I didn't make it up. I didn't sit around with the other apostles determining what we should say. That was pretty much given to us through the Old Testament and through Jesus himself. And so the context here in 2 Timothy of proclaiming the word is that it's a ministry that involves explaining the written word of God, but also preaching the gospel. Now, according to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, there are at least 33 Greek words translated as preaching or proclaiming. So that makes this job of proclaiming the word a whole lot bigger than what I'm just doing right now. A whole lot bigger. Not all of the words have to do with public speaking in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. All of the Christians except the apostles went from place to place proclaiming the Messiah. The actual word there is the word from which we get evangelism. They were good newsing people. It's used as a verb. They were good newsing people with the good news. And they were doing it from house to house. Obviously, they weren't standing behind the pulpit and preaching. Now, this, this means that every believer was involved in proclaiming the word. Timothy Keller, in his book on preaching, talks about three levels of proclaiming the word. Level one is basically what I just said. Every believer speaking the words, being involved in, in teaching and proclaiming the word of God. The second level would be word ministry gifts that function in ways besides public preaching, like in, in our day, writing, blogging, you know, teaching classes. And then the third level is proclaiming to a gathered audience, what I'm doing right now. 
Now, as we'll see later, Timothy as a spiritual leader in Ephesus is to preach and to teach, to proclaim the truth, but also to discuss it and to reason with individuals as Paul did. So Paul uses this word here, and it's a big word. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. So let's step back for a moment. While the gospel and the word of God must be proclaimed with words, there's more to it. There's the way that we proclaim it and the results. Paul said, I came to you and you received the word because there was power behind it based on what happened, but full conviction. We preach the word, the way we preach the word is every bit as important as what we say with the words. Because the gospel is both a proclamation of what God has done and a way of life given to us to serve God and our, and our fellow man. What we'll be doing next Saturday is part of proclaiming the gospel. There will be actions that will be seen as good works. But there will also hopefully be proclamation to people. Here's why. And if one asks, why are you doing this? Well, because we follow Jesus. And we must. It, it's really not an option. Everybody understands it. It's a willingness to lose in order to win, to serve as a way to lead, to suffer before being glorified. The way of Christ, the Lamb of God, is qualitatively different than the way of this present darkness. And as Christians, us, all of us are out there, that's what we represent and that's how we go about doing it. We don't just speak words, we act, we reason. We, we sometimes we plead, we pray. We always want to be representing Jesus as we're speaking. And Paul tells Timothy, look, do this with urgency. Do it in season and out of season. That simply means do it when it's timely and when it's untimely. When it's convenient for you or, un or inconvenient for you. Keep at it. It's a very relevant message. By this, I want you to reprove people, to, to rebuke and to exhort. Reproving means to convict of errors. Uh, correct means to use your mind, use logic and argument in a good sense to correct where people have gone wrong. Rebuke is a moral rebuke. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their nonsense about, about the, the, the superstitions they had related to how they practiced their faith. And then Paul says to exhort. Uh, this is the idea of appeal to reason with intensity. There's emotion involved. Use scripture to encourage the weak and the timid. In other words, use scripture to speak to the emotions of those who are discouraged. With, with, and so with these, we have the whole ball of wax. Scripture speaks to us intellectually. It speaks to us morally. And it speaks to us emotionally. And then Paul says, do it, Timothy, patiently. Do it patiently with all teaching. He again uses that word. By the way, it's okay for any of us to be the person in group settings or in a private conversation who says, wait a minute, what does the Bible have to say about that? What we're just talking about right now? What really? I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of talking. Are, are, we, are we thinking scripturally as we are talking? The long and short of this is that preaching the word has always involved our whole selves dedicated to Jesus, who alone offers salvation. It's a huge challenge, and it's not just words, but it is words, and it's actions, and it's attitude, and it's showing the beauty of what people who follow Jesus believe and how we live in front of each other. So the charge is to you and I. Paul mentions it to Timothy, and this is really, really important. It's the last thing on Paul's mind. Timothy, don't fail at this. Don't fail. And there's some good reasons for not failing. So here they are. Second point is the reasons for proclaiming the word. The reasons for proclaiming the word. The first reason is because Jesus is Lord and he is returning. Actually, that's only half of it. Paul is certainly looking forward to the return of Christ, but there's more to this. Here's what he says. I charge you, and that's that first word. This is verse 1. I charge you. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing 
and his kingdom. The word for charge here is the same word from which we get witness or martyr. It, that, that's the Greek word. And, and, and it, so Paul is saying, I, I, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who is judge of the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. In other words, Timothy, I can't say it any stronger. I solemnly charge you. I, I intensely charge you. I really, really mean it. Can't say it stronger. I do it by everything that I believe in. That's God and Jesus, his son. Now, it's pretty serious. And then Paul adds, by his appearing in kingdom. Now, we know from Scripture that we're accountable to God. There will be judgment. And I think that's what Paul is referring to here by, by the appearing in the kingdom of Jesus. We know that at the end in Revelation 20, there's this thing called a great white throne judgment where God is judging the nations of the earth and the people of the earth. And pretty much every, well, everyone there, according to Revelation 20, will hear the words, depart from me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, we have a judgment of Christ, the judgment seat of, of Christ, and that is where you and I, believers, are judged, are held accountable for what we've done in this life. We're accountable to Jesus for how we're living out our life right now. Now, I don't think we should think of it as big brother ready to crush us, but I think we should think of it as being accountable to our Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that is a serious title. So when you put the whole thing together, Paul is saying to Timothy, what I'm telling you, I'm telling you before God, it is impossible for me to put it in stronger terms. When you feel timid, Timothy, please remember that Jesus is the judge of all and he's coming back to establish his kingdom. So in a sense, this is Paul's way of saying, Timothy, God is great, therefore you don't have to be in, in control. God is glorious, therefore you don't have to be afraid of, if you're going to fear anybody, fear God. He's coming back to establish his kingdom. It's a way of saying to Timothy that this is more about, this is more than just about you and I, Timothy. This is about our responsibility before God. You and I both will answer before God. Now, Paul's going to give a beautiful statement at the end of this. But let's slow down here for a second. There's the application. The writer of Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. In Hebrews 10.31 he writes, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We're accountable as believers for what we do with our lives before Christ. I don't know if you've ever thought of the stakes of it, but the stakes are pretty high. Now again, I don't think because we are, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, as Paul writes in Romans. But there is accountability, and it's rightful accountability. When we have jobs, we're accountable to our bosses. Where did we ever come up with this concept of spare time? Of course, we are to rest. That's written in Scripture, right? We are to rest. In fact, we may be held accountable for not resting. Do you ever think of that? We are to rest from labors. God, there's a time for everything, right? God built in to human beings this time. But there is never a time, I think, that it could be said of Jesus that he doesn't care what we're doing. There's never a time when we can say, I'm going to put my Christianity aside for a little bit and rest from that. that. That's not the concept. We're accountable. And Paul wants to make this clear to Timothy. Timothy, you're accountable to do this. You need to do this. You need to do it. Okay. Because Christ is coming back. Second reason is this. Because there's a great need for it. Paul continues, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions 
and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Paul says the time's coming. This is a kairos kind of time, not a chronological kind of time. This is a time when nobody's going to listen, basically, is what Paul is saying. They will not endure to put up with healthy teaching. Ironically, in our culture and society, even in some church cultures, where about the only absolute anymore has become tolerance, there is almost complete intolerance for biblical teaching. Then as now, people don't really want to listen to God's word. They would rather make things up on their own. You know, the thought of being accountable is not real warm and fuzzy. They would rather listen to teaching that doesn't challenge them or doesn't require any kind of change of behavior. Here's the truth about it. And you go to any culture at any time on the face of the earth and the gospel pushes back at least somewhat to the culture. Always. The gospel has something to say to the culture that has wandered from the principles, the precepts, the way God says to live our lives. Whether it's a thousand years ago or now, the Bible is always pushed back. And it's at the places that the Bible pushes back that culture wants to ignore. They want to read the cool stuff, God is love, but then define it in ways that they want to define it, not in ways that God defines it or Scripture defines it. So Paul says that a time is coming, and it really is already there. He says they will accumulate for themselves teachers. That means that they're like collecting teachers to say what they want to hear. And they'll listen to those. And they'll turn around and they'll start listening to nonsense. So Paul's answer to Timothy is keep doing it. And one of the reasons, Timothy, is because it needs to be done. In a sense, it's kind of, if you don't do it, who will? If, if those who come after me like you don't do it, Timothy, who's going to do it? There's a deep need for it. All right, third, Timothy, it's, it's your responsibility. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I've already talked a little bit about responsibility, but let's look briefly at these very succinct phrases that Paul uses. So first, Timothy, be sober-minded, that is, be clear in your head, as opposed to those who will, not, who will not tolerate sound or healthy doctrine. The whole thing, right? First Timothy, Second Timothy, is that Timothy, stand up to the nonsense that's going on. That, that's going on for teaching. It's your responsibility. Be, you be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Oh, Why did you have to say that, Paul? Well, Paul was enduring it at that very moment as he writes it. Endure it because suffering will come. And when it does, you have a couple of choices. One choice is to whine about it and feel unfairly singled out by God and accuse him of being unjust. And you can look around at people who are not suffering as much as you and become embittered. Have it easy while you have it hard. You can take that approach. Or you can take the approach of looking at suffering through the eyes of Scripture. You can do as the early apostles did after being beaten by the Jewish officials for no good reason, and then they went and were thankful for being considered worthy to suffer for Jesus. Or we can believe Paul when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4 that the experience of your present suffering is going to equip you to become, or in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, to equip you to come along and encourage someone else because you will go through the same things that they are going through. Or you can believe Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 and 18, when he, when he says that this momentary light affliction is producing for me an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So the choice is ours. Now here's the logic behind it. No matter which way you choose, you're going to suffer. So doesn't it make sense to take the more healthy approach that makes you less bitter and actually uses your suffering to help people around you? So there's always logic to it, as well as emotion. Endure suffering, Paul says. Do the work of an evangelist. Look, in a sense, he's saying to Timothy, look, Timothy, I know that you're no Billy Graham, because he didn't exist yet, so that's why he was no Billy Graham. <laughs> but do the work of an evangelist. In other words, tell people how to be saved. 
Preach the good news. That's the word evangel. That's where it comes from, good news, gospel, evangel. Be an evangelist. I, I know that you, you know, this is not your strength, but do it. It's part of, part of your responsibility. And then fulfill your ministry. In other words, take it to the end. Do it, Timothy, until you die. It's your responsibility. There's a great story uh, in the medical word, world uh, by a guy named Bernard Brown. Uh, he was president of the Kennestone Regional Healthcare, in case you care about that. But he, he tells a story. He says he once worked in a hospital where a patient knocked over a cup of water which spilled on the floor beside the patient's bed. The patient was afraid that he might slip on the water if he got out of bed, so being a good patient, he asked the nurse's aide to mop it up. The patient didn't know it, but the hospital policy says that small spills were the responsibility of the nurse's aides, while large spills were to be mopped up by the hospital's housekeeping crew. The nurse's aide decided that the spill was a large one, so she couldn't do it, so she called housekeeping. The housekeeping people got there, and they said, no, this is a small spill. It's your job. It's not my responsibility, said the nurse's aide, because it's a large puddle. Housekeeper said, well, it's not mine. The puddle is too small. The exasperated patient listened for a time, then took a pitcher of water from his night table, poured the whole thing on the floor. <laughs> said, all right, now is it a small or little puddle? Somebody, please mop it up. So here's the point. Wherever and whenever you see a need, it's your responsibility as a follower of Jesus. Don't think somebody else is going to do it. Where you live, where you are, if you don't do it there, who will? It's your responsibility. When you see, I, I have another phrase I'd like, to, I'd like to add to the magnolia lingo. It's already a phrase you know. If you see something, say something. And by that, I mean this. When you see God working, we have stories that we're telling on Sunday. When you see God working, say something. Point it out to us and then join it. So if you see somebody in need, that's likely God working. And since you're the one who saw it, maybe God is saying, I want you to go take care of that or at least engage if you see something, say something. It's encouraging to all of us when we engage in this way, when we consider the whole thing our responsibility and not just somebody else's. All right, so Paul has given those reasons. There's one more. Because Paul would soon be gone. He writes this. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering in the time of my departure has come. That's verse 6. In other words, Timothy, do this, preach the word, because I'm going to be gone soon. You have to follow me. A drink offering, there's actually, this is interesting, we have eight English words to translate just two Greek words here. Already is one of those words. In other words, Paul's saying, look, it's already happening. The, the, the die is cast. The trial's going to happen. The outcome is predetermined. It's already in the works. And then he says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. That's just one Greek word. It's the word spendo. We get the word spend or spent from. I'm being spent. I'm being poured out. Drink offerings were something that was done in both Greek and Hebrew culture. They had sacrificed and they'd pour the drink. Jesus mentioned uh, to his disciples, can you drink from the cup that I'm going to drink from? That the, in the Old Testament, the cup of God's wrath was going to be drunk by people to the very end until it was totally empty. Paul says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. I'm being spent. It's already happening. There are very few who will work on what I've started, Timothy, and you are one of the very few. Again, this is a time when the, the original apostles were dying. Perhaps by this time, all gone, except John, Peter, and Paul. We don't know for sure, but this first generation of Christians were being spent, literally being killed. It was a worry by Paul. Who, who's, Timothy, you have to do this. We cannot rest forever on the leadership of the preceding generation. The day comes when we must step into their shoes and ourselves take the lead. So all of you younger than me, I hope you're hearing this. 
There was a time when I was young and had to take the, had to take the baton from somebody older than me. I have spent the greater part of the last 10 years making sure I'm passing the baton on to others. This is serious stuff. It is the way our faith is passed on through relationship, through teaching, through patience. And Paul writes, Timothy, Timothy, you got to do it. I'm not going to be here forever. And then finally, he ends on a high note before he finishes his letter to Timothy that we'll look at in a couple of weeks from now. The example and the reward. Here's where we get the words right here. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the faith. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So I think Olympics here. All of you have that image, I'm sure, in your head. Because it's an athletic metaphor about performance and reward, these are all verbs in the perfect tense signifying past action with continuing results. Literally, Paul writes this, the good fight I have fought. The race I have finished. The faith I have kept. He writes it very artfully, really. The good fight contested the good contents. The Greek word is agathon, which has to do with quality. We could substitute the word noble. I have fought the noble fight. He writes in 1 Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. The word for fight is the word from which we get agonize or agony. Fight the good, agonize the good agony, if you want to put it that way, of faith. Fight it. Timothy, it's a good fight. Don't get involved in fights that aren't good. Don't get involved in fights that are nonsense. We, we've heard Paul say time and time again, don't get into stupid arguments. Don't get into that kind of fighting. It, 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 it accomplishes nothing. But there are some fights that are good, that are noble. This is one of them, Timothy, the gospel. This is a noble cause, a good fight. You can spend your whole life on this and never come to the end of it. It is a noble thing. Fight that one. I have finished the race. I'm done. My race is over. I've crossed the finish line. I'm lying. And, and you've seen this in the Olympics. Somebody running so hard, they just, they just crumple in exhaustion. Um, I remember seeing a cross-country ski race once. And those cross, that's probably the most brutal race, I think, of any Olympic sport. When they cross the finish line, they're just done. They're finished. They're spent. They crumple out of, out of just exhaustion. That's the, the image. I've, I've finished the race, I'm done. I'm lying exhausted at the finish line. I've done everything. I haven't left anything out on the field. I've given it my all. I'm, I've finished. And I have kept the faith. I have never waiter, wavered or watered down or mistaught or wandered from the gospel. I've passed on to others what I received. Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he died, he was buried, that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to all these people, including me, Timothy. I have kept that faith. And there's a reward attached. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. This is, this is not God bribing you and I to behave and do things right. This is not, do this and I'll give you a cookie. The reward is a natural outflow of the action. It, it's, it's not an add-on at the end. It's, it's one of the results of living this way. That's the reward that Paul is talking about. He calls it the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, well, yes, the, the word for crown is Stephanos. You've probably heard that before. Uh, you know, think again, uh, athletes in Greek Olympics getting, getting the, 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 the leaves, you know, the crown of leaves on their head. This is a golden crown, the Stephanos. It's righteousness. 
It is what the crown consists of. Now, Paul already knows he's been made righteous by Christ, but Christ also awards him righteousness in that day, the day when he will judge all things. But Paul says, not just me, not just me, but to all of those who have loved his appearing. Now, here's something to understand, and this is really cool. In athletic events, there's usually only one winner, right? Second place is first loser. Not in this race. Not in this race. To all, not just to me, to all who have loved his appearing. Everybody, everybody who participates in this way receives this. Paul, of course, uses symbols for it. We, we don't know the half of it. He uses phrases that we can understand. The promises that God have made, has made to us are so great, so wonderful. I don't think we know the half of it. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. Part of the reason, I think, for that is this. We have longings <laughs> as human beings. If you know the story of C.S. Lewis, he followed those longings because he saw nothing on this earth that could deliver. He finally reasoned, if I have within me a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the logical explanation is I was created for another world where those things are satisfied. Hunger presupposes food. We, all of us, have deep within us from being created in God's image this, this longing for something we know isn't here. And we strive and strive and strive for it. What Paul is saying to Timothy is this. Timothy, you live this way. And you follow Jesus in this way. Everything, your heart's longing, everything, is the natural outcome of preaching the word, of fulfilling your ministry, of doing it to the end. Next step is this as the band comes up. What's God called you to? What, what ministry? What service? What has he called and equipped you to do? Lot, and I'm speaking to the choir, I understand this. A lot, of you, a lot of you have been doing this for years, so I guess I would say keep on doing it. Excel still more, as Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians. What does he equip? Something that if you don't do it, it will not get done. He has equipped you, and he has gifted you uniquely. So today, as part of that proclaiming the word that you are a part of and I am a part of, rededicate yourself to completing what God has uniquely called you to do. There is, at the end of it here, everything your heart has ever desired as the natural outcome, the, the reward, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, as Paul writes in Philippians. I press on. Let's all do that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, which is so complete and so brilliant. Thank you for inspiring people like Paul to write it. Thank you for the instruction that it can give us. But more importantly, thank you for the support and the call to serve that it gives to us. Lord, we are accountable to you. You are the righteous judge, and we thank you. We thank you that while we're accountable to you, you are not a God or a father or a boss who is impossible to please. 
Paul says, there now waits for me the crown of righteousness. We will hear your words, Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. And everything we've longed for in this life here, we will see that you have fulfilled it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us to desire that above all. And we pray this in your name. Amen.